This is the seventh day of this April 1981, seven days of Sheen. And this morning we will read from and comment on the Zen teaching of Wang Po, translated by John Blofeld. People sometimes say, when they hear Zen words and phrases and talks and dialogues, particularly also of Wang Po, of whom we read so frequently, I don't understand it. And there's a real deep frustration almost self-accusation in this, not understanding. What one is saying at such a time is the meaning of the words don't make sense according to my past experience and the logic developed from that. If that is so, can one abstain from frustration? Just let the words sink in, listening, like listening to the birds <coughs> and to the sneeze. A sashin is a time of plowing, plowing the soil, turning it over, digging in it, loosening it. So let the seeds sink in, let the words sink in. They may sprout at the time least expected. Understanding of such <coughs> words is never the literal meaning, the intellectual meaning of the words. It is seeing within oneself that to which the words point. And in that it is not a matter of Wang Po and oneself. These sermons, sayings, and dialogues were collected by mostly by Pesu, his scholar disciple, a devoted disciple, but he's also a very scholarly person, very much attached to the word. Not unlike Ananda, the, dis the disciple of the Buddha, who attended on the Buddha for 30 years, but so attached to his knowledge that he couldn't see the truth behind the words until after the Buddha's death. Pesu's preface, part of it, just a few lines. The great Zen master Si Yun, which is Wang Po, Obaku in Japanese, lived below the vulture peak on Mount Wang Po in the district of Kaoan, which forms part of the prefecture of Hung Chao. He was third in the direct line of descent from Wei Nang, <coughs> the sixth patriarch, and the pupil of a fellow disciple of Wei Hai. Holding in esteem only the intuitive method of the highest vehicle, which cannot be communicated in words, he taught nothing but the doctrine of the one mind, capital O, capital M holding that there is nothing else to teach in that both mind and substance are void and that the chain of causation is motionless. Mind is like the sun journeying through the sky and emitting glorious light uncontaminated by the finest particle of dust and yet illuminating every particle dust. 
to those who have realized the nature of reality, there is nothing old or new, and conceptions of shallowness and depth are meaningless. Those who speak of it do not attempt to explain it, establish no sects, and open no doors or windows. That which is before you is it. Begin to reason about it, and you will at once fall into error. Error being duality. The explainer and that which is explained. And the explained is never the real thing. Which is no thing. Only when you have understood this will you perceive your oneness with the original Buddha nature. Therefore his words were simple, his reasoning direct, his way of life exalted and his habits unlike the habits of other men. Manjusri represents fundamental law and Samanta Bahadra activity. We, we always return the merit of our chanting to Shakyamuni Buddha, Manjusri Bodhisattva, Avalokita Bodhisattva Bahadra. Who are they? One person once who was temporarily a member of the center. When she heard of all these bodhisattvas, she said, I just left the Catholic church and I'm getting into the same thing again. All these saints around here. <laughs> or bodhisattvas, you call them, but it's the same thing. Manjusri, fundamental law or wisdom clear seeing with no illusion and Samanta Bahadra activity the action of clear think thinking which is not really two because clear thinking is not a passive thing coming to you there is no you there is only clear th seeing and the action and that are one <coughs> and yet put it into words and you use two words. And pretty soon, out of words, one creates something. Of course, these bodhisattvas are supposed to have lived. These were disciples of the Buddha at the time of his teaching. But here, Wang Po doesn't talk about these personalities. By the former, Manjusri, Wang Po continues, is meant the law of the real and unbounded void. And by the latter, the inexhaustible activities beyond the sphere of form. Way he says, beyond the, the sphere of form, of the concept of form. A cup dropping from the shelf and catching at the same time, you save a good form there of the chatter. And yet it isn't that one intends to do anything or says this, it's one. The falling and the catching are one. Avalukiteshvara represents boundless compassion, 
Mahasthama, great wisdom, Vimalakirti, spotless name. We don't list all of those, but they come up at other times. Vimalakirti was a great layman at the time of the Buddha, and there's a sutra about his life and teaching. But again, it's not the personalities Wang Po is referred, referring to or concerned with at all. The footnote says, this abstract notion of the bodhisattvas regarded by some sects as individual spiritual entities is shared by some Buddhists outside the Zen sect. Spotless, Wang Po says, refers to the real nature of things, while name means form. Yet form is really one with real nature, hence the combined term spotless name. Wreck your brain over this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I want to wreck mine over commenting on it. All the qualities typified by the great bodhisattvas are inherent in men, and incidentally in women, <laughs> and are not to be separated from the one mind. There's no real man who is in whom isn't harm harmonized the masculine and the feminine. There's no true woman in whom is not harmonized the true feminine and the true masculine. This is not so, there's something out of kilter. Yet a man is a man and a woman is a woman. Awake to it, and it is there. Sometimes, to some people, it is excruciatingly painful to find that this is all there is. Dying the great death to this idea of what there should be or could be, and finding what there is. And that there's nothing outside of that. You students of the way who do not awake to this in your own minds and who are attached to appearances, or who seek for something objective outside of your own minds, have all turned your backs on the way. the sands of the Ganges. The Buddha said of these sands, if all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas with Indra and all the gods, Indra was the highest god of the Indian pantheon of gods, and all the gods walk across them, the sands do not rejoice, and if oxen, sheep, reptiles, and insects tread upon them, the sands are not angered. For jewels and perfumes they have no longing, and for the stinking filth of manure and urine they have no loathing. (coughs) One time the disciple questioned, Illusion can hide from us our own mind, but up to now you have not taught us how to get rid of illusion. You have not taught us how to get rid of illusion. And Wang Po answers, the arising and the elimination of illusion are both illusory. Illusion is not something rooted in reality. Or in truth, we can say. Because an illusion can be real enough with all its manifestations in the body-mind. But he's not using the word reality in this way. He means truth, whatever that means. 
illusion is not something rooted in truth. It exists because of your dualistic thinking. Me and what I need, me and what I must do or must not do. Always the controller in that which he or she is trying to control or trying to get rid of. Whereas that which he or she is trying to control is the very stuff out of which the controller is made. They're not two. And that's the illusion that they are two. This is why I just said time and again, when anger arises or frustration or pain, make it move. Or who? They are not two. Question it, not knowing what it is, because if you know it, you react to it. You want it or you don't want it. And you're split. If you will only, Huang Po continues, if you will only cease to indulge in opposed concepts, such as ordinary and enlightened, <coughs> illusion will cease of itself. And then if you still want to destroy it whenever, wherever it may be, you will find that there's not a hair breadth left of anything on which to lay hold, which incidentally takes great attention. Illuminating energy of seeing whatever comes up. Don't just say nothing else is there, because you ignore it. because you have the idea that there's nothing there, because one read this once someplace in Huang Po. <laughs> this is the meaning of, quote, I will let go with both hands and both feet, for then I shall certainly discover the Buddha in my own mind. Well, the latter part is still a speculation. You don't know if you will or not. But can one let go with both hands and feet? Which means to, to see what one is clutching and to abstain from that freely in questioning who or who. Can the moo, who, or what is it, or what am I, can that be the abstaining from holding on to all these images one has of oneself, past, present, and future? And practice as nobody. Truly nobody. Right in the midst of the pain and ache of being nobody. Questioner. If there's nothing on which to lay hold, how is the Dharma to be transmitted? Wang Po. It is a transmission of mind with mind. Questioner, if the mind is used for transmission, why do you say that mind too does not exist? You're very well versed in logic. And for some reason he has to go through it for our sake because we too are very well versed in logic. If mind is used for transmission, why do you say that mind does not exist? And Wang Po says, obtaining no dharma or truth whatsoever is called mind transmission. The understanding of this mind implies no mind and no dharma. Questioner, if 
There is no mind and no dharma. What is meant by transmission? <laughs> Notice Wang Po uses no stick. He uses words. Free words, flowy freeing, flowly freeing. Wang Po, you hear people speak of mind transmission and then you talk of something to be received. So Bodhidharma said, quote, The nature of the mind when understood, no human speech can compass or disclose, encompass. It cannot be contained. Or made known, disclose, made known. Enlightenment is not to be attained, and he that gains it does not say he knows. And Wang Po finishes by saying, if I, were to make, if I were to make this clear to you, I doubt if you could stand up to it. Once I put this question to the Master, how many of the four or five hundred persons gathered here on this mountain have fully understood your reverence's teaching? And the Master answered, their number cannot be known. Why? because my way is through mind awakening. How can it be conveyed in words? You can say, how can it be counted in numbers? Huang Po continues, speech only produces some effect when it falls on the uninstructed ears of children. Meaning maybe speech produces what we call effect when there is obeying, following, imitating. That is cause and effect. The speech and the admonition is the cause, and the obeying, the following, the imitating is the effect. But this is not the way. The way is without effect in any known or conventional ordinary sense because it has no cause. acts on its own. <coughs> but we, with our puny conditioning, always want to meddle, and so we muddle. Rather than listening, questioning in silence, in profound silence, the silence of not willing and wanting and expecting and projecting and running away and fearing. All of which is this endless wheel of cause and effect. As everyone who goes to Sishin can clearly discover for himself or herself. 
How marvelous to be able to discover that. And how silly to be discouraged over it. And he already set something new into motion. Discouragement being a cause of, again, new effects which become new causes, and so it goes. Moo hoo What is it? It can cut through that, even that, even though it does not repress. Because it works in the midst of it. Not knowing. Here the questioner who is steeped in traditional writings says, Yet it is recorded that, quote, whosoever possesses the 32 characteristic signs of Buddha in some place they are listed. As soon as one reads this, one starts looking at oneself. Do I at least possess... <laughs> Do I at least possess a half a sign? <laughs> he seems to have four or five. <laughs> But don't tell me he's got more than that. Uh, well, we can go on endlessly with it. <coughs> Whosoever possesses the 32 characteristic signs of a Buddha is able to deliver sentient beings. How can you deny it? Says the disciple, because it's written in the scripture. The scripture you hold on high and put only in high places. That's the tradition. There's nothing wrong with the tradition, but it does a lot of things to the mind. Wang Po, anything possessing any signs is illusory. It is by perceiving that all signs are no signs that you perceive the Tathagata. Buddha, meaning the thus come. Or as Joshua perceived nonsense, thus lying down on that couch. No special signs. Buddha quotes and sentient beings quotes. Wang Po continues, <clears throat> are both your own false conceptions. It is because you do not know real mind that you delude yourself with such objective concepts. If you will conceive of a Buddha, you will be obstructed by that Buddha. Here are three exclamation marks behind this. <laughs> <coughs> Wonder whether, that's in, whether the Chinese have exclamation marks. <laughs> and when you conceive of sentient beings, you will be obstructed by those sentient beings which means you won't see them as they are, standing right next to you, in their misery or in their joy. You need to conceive of anybody. Everybody's there. Everything is there. All such dualistic concepts as ignorant and enlightened, says Yuang Po, pure and impure are obstructions. <clears throat> it is because your minds are hindered by them that the wheel of the law must be turned. The footnote says that the relative truths of orthodox Buddhism must be taught. Well, Yuang Po doesn't say that. <clears throat> just as apes spend their time throwing things away and picking them up again. <laughs> <laughs> Unceasingly. <clears throat> Once watched in, the, in this movie, 
of this Jane Goddard who, who has lived for years with What are those? Gorillas, with gorillas. No? Oh, that's the wrong person. It's the one who lived with the gorillas. Uh, Mary something or other. <laughs> For ten years she lived with them, trying to just be with them. Really, really be with them. She, she was with them. And then finally one of them ventured out, a little one of course, the old ones, they probably, probably know it all too. But the little one, coming up then, picking up that camera and inspecting it, <laughs> looking at it, and putting it away, running away again, and coming back, <laughs> picking it up again, looking, <laughs> <laughs> licking it. And she could hardly contain herself with joy. <clears throat> Just as apes spend their time throwing things away and picking them up unceasingly, so it is with you and your learning. <clears throat> All you need is to give up your learning and your ignorant and enlightened and pure and impure. All in quotation marks. Learning meaning accumulated learning. Never means wide eyes as you go. Seeing, learning as you go, but then not stuffing it in your rucksack. Because then it will hinder your next clear seeing. All you need is to give up your learning, ignorant, enlightened, pure, impure, great, little, attachment, activity. Such things are mere conveniences, mere ornaments within the one mind. I hear you have studied the sutras and the, of the twelve divisions of the three vehicles. They are all mere empirical concepts. Really, you must give them up. So just discard all that you've acquired as being no better than a bedspread for you when you were sick. Only when you've rid yourself of the whole gamut of dualistic concepts of the ignorance and the enlightened category will you at, l at last earn the title of a transcendental Buddha. Therefore it is written, your prostrations are in vain, put no faith in such ceremonies. It's interesting, I picked this out. One of the, quote, anecdotes, it's under anecdotes. Our master once attended an assembly at the Bureau, Bureau of the Imperial Salt Commissioners. Salt is life to people. Without salt, you can't live, which meant those who had the salt had the power over the people. They were big shots. Not only that, they had the power of life and death over the people. So here was an assembly at the Bureau of Imperial Salt Commissioners at which the Emperor Tai Chung was also present as a Shramanera, as a disciple. A layman who had taken the ten precepts instead of the normal five, says Blofeld. <coughs> the Shramanera, the Emperor, noticed our master enter the hall of worship and make a triple prostration to the Buddha, whereupon he asked, if we are to seek nothing from the Buddha, Dharma or Sangha, what does your reverence seek by such prostrations? Though I seek not from the Buddha, replied our master, or from the Dharma, or from the Sangha, it is my custom to show respect in this way. But what purpose does it serve? insisted the Shramanera, whereupon he suddenly received a slap. The emperor, mind you. 
Oh, he exclaimed, how uncouth you are. <laughs> <laughs> what is this, cried the master, imagining making, imagine making a distinction between refined and uncouth. And so saying, he administered another slap. Ca causing the Stramonera to betake himself elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> In another version, it said, it says, after that he loved him that much more dearly. <laughs> so you see, they're different interpretations always. Once when our master had just dismissed the first of the daily assemblies in the monastery, I happened to enter its precincts. Presently I noticed a wall painting and by questioning the monk in charge of the monastery's administration, learned that it portrayed a certain famous monk. Indeed, I said, yes, I can see his likeness before me. But where is the man himself? My question was received in silence. So I remarked, but surely there are Zen monks here in this temple, aren't there? It said something very profound, maybe without realizing it. Where is the man himself? Yes, replied the monastery administrator, there is one. After that, I requested an audience with a master and repeated to him my recent conversation. Pesu, cried the master. Sir, I answered respectfully. Where are you? Realizing no reply was possible to such a question, I hastened to ask our ma master to re-enter the hall and continue his sermon. One day, five new arrivals presented themselves to our master in a group. One of them, instead of making the customary prostration, remained standing and greeted him somewhat casually with a motion of his clasped hand. Uh. And do you know how to be a good hunting dog? inquired our master. I must follow the antelope's scent. Suppose it leaves no scent. What will you follow then? Ah, oh, then I'll follow its hoof marks. And if there were no hoof marks, what then? I could still follow the animal's tracks. But if there were not even tracks, how would you follow it then? Hmm. In that case, said the newcomer, would surely be a dead antelope. Our master said nothing more at the time. But the following morning after his sermon, he asked, will yesterday's antelope hunting monk now step forward? <laughs> the monk complied and our master inquired, yesterday, my reverend friend, you were left without anything to say. How was that? Finding that the other returned no answer, he continued, Ah, you may call yourself a real monk, but you're just an amateur novice. Yeah, how, how does one ask that trackless, scentless, hoof, Print less moo. Oh. -ho. No traces to go by. 
nur der Sein ist Joshua selbst. Is that still hunting? In the middle of one of his talks, Huang Po says, when a sudden flash of thought occurs in your mind and you recognize it for a dream or an illusion, rather than say, use the word recognize, is to see it for a dream and an illusion. When a sudden flash of thought occurs in the mind, and you see it for a dream, an illusion. Then you can enter into the state reached by the Buddhas of the past. <coughs> not that the Buddhas of the past really exist, or that the Buddhas of the future have not yet come into existence. Because past, present, and future too are flashes of thought. Useful when you have to run a daily sashin schedule. You have to know what time it is. But not useful at all in questioning mu or who, or what am I, or what is it. Then yesterday's experiences and tomorrow's experiences are a hindrance, a hindrance. Above all, have no longing to become a future Buddha. Your sole concern should be, as thought succeeds thought, to avoid clinging to any of them. Nor may you entertain the least <coughs> ambition to be a Buddha here and now. Even if a Buddha arises, do not think of him as, quote, capitalized, enlightened, unquote, or deluded, or good, or evil. Hasten to rid yourself of any desire to cling to him. Cut him off in the twinkling of an eye. The twinkling of the eye being the cutting. The inner eye of awareness and attention, which is pure energy. On no account seek to hold him fast. On no account seek to hold him fast. For a thousand locks could not stay him, nor a hundred thousand feet of rope bind him. This being so valiantly strive to banish and annihilate him. <clears throat> the concept, the attachment. This ancient, archetypical longing to worship. Which is neither right nor wrong, but it is not seeing. And in another talk, though others may talk of the way of the Buddhas as something to be reached by various pious practices and by sutra study, you must have nothing to do with such ideas. A perception, sudden as blinking, that subject and object are one, that the seer is the seen, the hearer is the heard.
will lead to a deeply mysterious, wordless understanding. And by this understanding you will awake to the truth of Zen. And we're skipping. Your true nature is something never lost to you, (coughs) even in moments of delusion, nor is it gained at the moment of enlightenment. In it is neither delusion nor right understanding. It fills the void everywhere. It is intrinsically of the substance of the one mind. How then can your mind-created objects exist outside the void? The void is fundamental without spatial dimensions, (laughs) passions, activities, delusions or right understanding. As all this happens blindly, ignorantly, you must clearly understand that in it there are no things. Things always being something which in German we say bedingt, conditioned. Ding is thing and bedingt is conditioned. No men and no Buddhas. For this void contains not the smallest hairbreadth of anything that can be viewed spatially. It depends on nothing and is attached to nothing. It depends on nothing. And it works freely and on its own. Beyond all our expectations. It is all pervading, Wang Po continues. It is all pervading spotless beauty. the self-existent and uncreated absolute? How then can it even be a matter for discussion that the real Buddha has no mouth and preaches no dharma and that real hearing requires no ears? For who could hear it? When hearer and hearing and heard are one. Ah, it is a jewel beyond all price. We will end here. The Four Vows. All beings without number. I vow to liberate endless blind passions. I vow to.
Blood.